Welcome everybody to my presentation. I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about moderate predictive control and in particular its application in automotive industrial production. My name is Alberto Beppert. I'm a control professor at the IMT School for Advanced Studies in Lucca in Italy and I'm also co-founder of the company Odis. So let me start by defining what vehicle control uh, is as in every control system, our goal is to ensure proper vehicle uh, operation by manipulating certain actuators so that uh, certain output variables, variables of interest that we want to control, uh, for example, the longitudinal uh, velocity of the vehicle or other quantities, track a given reference signal, so our desired, say, uh, velocity. And we do this by exploiting feedback from sensor measurements by means of a control algorithm. So it's a piece of software sitting in the control board that, given sensor information, uh, decides uh, in real time what the different actuator values should, should be. So this is fundamental for um, ensuring that the vehicle uh, behaves properly, and in particular, that the vehicle is uh, efficient by optimizing several subsystems uh, of the vehicle and the vehicle motion itself, uh, or by properly managing the energy, for example, in a hybrid electric vehicle, uh, we want to save as much um, fuel as, as possible. And uh, also the other main task of control uh, vehicle controls are ensure that the passenger travels with comfort and in particular it's safe. Okay, so what are examples of vehicle control systems? There are many, up to the, say, the highest level of um, control, if you want, that is autonomous driving. So these systems involve um, different complexities. In particular, these um, source of complexity is due to the presence of multiple actuators. For example, when you want to control the dynamics of the vehicle, you can uh, actuate four uh, traction and braking forces acting at uh, the wheels. Um, front steering, even rear steering in some cases, and also you may have electric motors contributing to the traction of the, of the vehicle as well. So these are all uh, actuators that affect simultaneously the dynamics of the system. In addition, uh, the dynamics can be non-linear and uncertain. Again, since think about the vehicle dynamics, the relation between tire slip and the resulting longitudinal and lateral forces are quite and nonlinear and also not very easily captured by, by models. And not only the dynamics are covered, but also the different subsystems um, acting on the vehicle are interacting together. For example, the engine control system is related to the transmission control system as well as to uh, the battery management and even the heat distribution inside, inside the vehicle. These are all coupled together. So control is the fundamental piece of software that can handle uh, those challenges, that complexity, and ensure proper vehicle uh, operations. There are many different control uh, strategies one can use uh, for designing vehicle control systems. Let me start with the most um, standard ones, uh, classical control techniques, in particular PID control, which is still heavily used in, uh, in industry, and in particular in the automotive industry. And what is the advantage of uh, PID controllers is that these are single loops that are very easy to tune. Basically, you only have uh, three parameters to choose, the proportional um, constant KP for proportional error feedback and also the terms TI, TD for the integral and derivative term. It can be implemented in very few lines of uh, C code, doesn't take much memory and is fast to compute. And also, it doesn't require to model the process explicitly because it's only based on output measurements. Okay, so why then should we consider new control methods and more advanced control strategies? Well, there are um, a certain number of requirements and increasingly stringent requirements that you need to satisfy to design a vehicle control system. And um, a better control performance um, can be only achieved if you coordinate different actuators in a good way, hopefully in an optimal way. So the number, as I was mentioning before, the number of actuators is increasing. Uh, the actuators are limited 
so you cannot decide arbitrarily the value that an actuator has, for example, a valve is between 0 and 100%, and also you want the controller to be resilient in case uh, some of these main actuators uh, fails. In addition to that, not only the problem is more complicated and more challenging, but also the time to develop the controller gets shorter and shorter. That's why you need a control strategy that can address those requirements. And the classical controls unfortunately have limitations, and not much if you have single loops, they can still be a very good solution. But when you have uh, multiple uh, input and multiple outputs interacting together, designing single control loops and coordinate them can be quite uh, challenging. And in particular, those loops interact with each other, so if you want to fine-tune and change the parameters of one of those loops, these will have an influence on the other loops as well, due to the interaction. And often this is um, addressed by designing lookup tables, but lookup tables get more and more complex the more inputs that you have in the table. Uh, for example, if you have lookup table for five inputs with 10 values each, it's already two to the power of five entries that you need to introduce in, in the table. And you may come up with a scheme that works reasonably well. You're never sure whether this is optimal. It's actually often hard to coordinate um, those activities are optimally according to a certain uh, criterion. And if you change uh, the system, for example, if you uh, have designed a controller for a certain vehicle and now you go to the next vehicle, new vehicle model, maybe it's just slightly different, but it's different from the previous one, then you may need to calibrate again the controller and, for example, retune the lookup tables and the controller gains. So this can be quite time consuming. Moreover, uh, those more classical linear control schemes don't directly handle the input constraints, so you may have to add anti wind up scheme to make sure that the constraints are probably uh, enforced. Output constraints are more difficult to, to handle than input constraints. You cannot just saturate the value, you, you have to be um, too careful the, the way you generate the activity value so that the outputs of interest that you want to try the reference also satisfy certain constraints, so are within certain bounds. And if a certain actuator fails, you, you have to design the single loop controllers so that they work also in the absence of some of the actuators. Then you have to make sure that for every possible configuration of the, um, of the multi-input, multi-output controller, this works properly, which adds extra effort in designing the controller. So in many cases, these um, classical control methods can be inadequate because they are uh, either not reaching optimal uh, an optimal design, so they don't ensure an optimal uh, performance, or just because they are very time consuming to, to design and to calibrate. Now, what are alternatives? Certainly a good alternative is modern predictive control, which is the topic of my uh, presentation today. So the idea of MPC is instead of breaking the multivariable control system into uh, multiple loops, it handles the whole control problem in one shot. So the algorithm generates altogether a certain number of inputs so that a certain number n of outputs uh, track the corresponding reference signals. And it does this by uh, using a model of the process uh, that we are controlling uh, in order to make predictions about the future evolution of the process if you apply a certain sequence of inputs. And uh, among all possible uh, predictions that can be done, it chooses the best one. So it chooses the best um, sequence of inputs in the future, so in the prediction, that optimizes a certain performance index. That's why it's called model predictive control, exploit the model of the process to make predictions about the evolution of the process so that the optimal choice among all those possible um, evolutions delivers a optimal control action. Optimal with respect to, to the model you've done, so if the model is not perfect, then it will not be optimal, but if the model is good enough, it will be a good control action. We'll come back on discussing about model quality in a second. So the idea of MPC is, um, is actually not very uncommon. That's actually what you do if you think about it when you drive uh, your car. When you drive, 
what you do is to look ahead a, a certain horizon, in this case a certain space, for example the next 50 meters, you don't have to look ahead the entire path between where you are now and where you want to go, say 10 kilometers away, just the short uh, close uh, prediction, okay, so the next meters you want to travel, taking into account uh, what is in front of you and around you, so the obstacle, the constraints, on your, in this case the constraints on your longitudinal position, and then you plan a sequence of moves, so the way you want, for example, uh, brake and steer your vehicle in order to turn right. And then as you move, you replan continuously what you're going to do next. So, for example, when you have turn right, then you will forecast what happens between where you, are, you will be next and the next, say, 50 or 100 meters, depending on your speed. That is exactly what is the idea behind MPC. And to say this more formally, let me introduce the optimization problem that MPC solves. So the prediction model, the one here highlighted in orange color, is a mathematical model relating the inputs to the outputs to the states of the model of the system. And uh, this model is used in prediction, so between the current time, say current time t, which I label as um, zero, up to a certain time t plus n in the future. Okay, so you look over a future of n steps, what happens to the system according to the prediction, and try to optimize a performance index. You have different forms of the performance indexes you can use. For example, you can look at how uh, large is the tracking error, so the difference between the predicted output and the reference signal you want to track. So this would be the difference between the blue points you predict and the um, green signal, which is the reference. But also you may have some penalties on the inputs you apply and uh, say corresponding optimal uh, inputs that you would like to apply for the reference you want to track. So this is an optimal control problem. You can include constraints in the problem. So you may want to find the optimal sequence of inputs that minimize the performance index, but that satisfies certain constraints. So the inputs in particular are between lower and upper bounds, and the outputs um, as well must be, you can require that must be within uh, upper lower bounds. So this is an optimal control problem that depends on the initial state, which is the current state, xt, where we are now. Let's say you can solve this problem by mapping the optimal control problem into a numerical optimization um, problem. You solve this problem, you will get a sequence of uh, uh, optimal inputs. Now, rather than applying the whole sequence of inputs that you have computed, you only apply the first sample, the one highlighted here in the green circle, and at the next time step, t plus one, so after one sample step, you will repeat the procedure. So you will um, get an estimate of the new state, xt plus one, uh, re-optimize the problem, okay, between time t plus one and t plus n plus one, get the new sequence, apply the first input, and so on. So this is called a receding horizon uh, mechanism because the horizon over which you make the predictions and optimize uh, recedes or slides over, over time. So when the model is linear, so the model that you use um, to build the, the predictions is a linear relation between inputs and, and states and between states and outputs, so given by linear state space uh, representation, then uh, the real-time optimization problem you need to solve is a quadratic program with respect to the sequence of inputs, so let's call Z the sequence of inputs. Now the idea of MPC is not uh, new, so the MPC concept date at least back to the 60s and as a result MPC is used uh, I'll say routinely in the process industries since the, the 80s and indeed in, uh, uh, in process control what is called APC advanced process control actually means modern predictive uh, control. Now regarding um, applications of MPC in the automotive domain a lot of research has been done um, over the last decades, 
It's not only us, there are many, many groups, um, both in academia and in industry, that have been looking at research projects uh, using MPC. Nowadays, I would say most, if not all, the automotive OEMs, entire one suppliers, are looking into MPC uh, solutions. Um, let me mention one uh, particular application which is particularly popular these days, often uh, attacked by MPC ideas. This is also a problem where I've been working in the past. So it's autonomous driving, where the, uh, the control goal is to coordinate torque requests and the steering of the vehicle, so to uh, achieve a safe and comfortable um, drive of course avoiding collisions. So let me show you an animation of the controller in simulation. So the red dots are prediction uh, steps in space. Let me mention another uh, application of MPC for controlling gasoline turbocharged engines. In this case there is a single output which is the engine uh, torque you want to achieve and you have four uh, actuators, four inputs the throttle, waste gate, valves, and the intake and exhaust cams. So I have four inputs uh, to manipulate in order to get the desired torque with maximum efficiency while satisfying constraints on the actuators as well as on other variables of the problem. And uh, this has been designed uh, together with General Motors and, and Audis. The results are um, Detail in this uh, paper appeared at the SAE World Congress in 2018. Actually, this application went in production starting late 2018 uh, together with another uh, MPC application for powertrain control uh, using CBT. So these are both in, in production and in mass production and as far as, as we know, it, this is the first at least documented mass production of MPC in the automotive uh, industry. And let me mention that uh, all this MPC software is running uh, nowadays on three, more than 3 million vehicles worldwide in different applications. So what are the advantages of MPC? So why MPC um, is, is used? Uh, and why uh, many automotive companies are attracted by, by MPC. As I was mentioning before, this is one controller for the entire multivariable system, so it spontaneously coordinates multiple inputs and multiple outputs by solving one single optimization problem. And it doesn't have, even to be, to, you don't need to have uh, the same number of inputs and outputs as you would have if you have single loops. Actually, for example, the number of inputs as the Engine control system we've seen before can be larger than the number of outputs. So you, you have to allocate the actuation act, action optimally uh, and multiple combinations exist that gives you the same output. You want to find the optimal one. It naturally handles constraints on inputs and outputs. You just add specify those constraints in the problem formulation. And those will be uh, satisfied. You can include preview on the reference signal. You just plug in the samples of the reference that you know in advance, and the optimization will depend, the result of the optimization will depend on those references. And once you have a design done for, say, a certain um, vehicle or a certain engine or a certain component of the system, then it's usually quite uh, easy to transfer the existing design to the new model. And uh, not only that, but also changing the configuration runtime, it's uh, actually very easy because say an actuator is stuck at some point, then you can just uh, change the constraint, say U min equal U max, say equal zero. So when that input is not, is not available. So the controller will reconfigure automatically because the new constraints will be taken into account in the new optimization problem solved since now. Is now on. Now there are some prices to pay. First of all, the code to implement the controller is no longer as simple as PID control laws or other type of uh, classical control. So you need to formulate and solve the QP problem uh, online. So the code for constructing and solving the problem must run on the board. It requires a process 
uh, model. So you need a prediction model. So you need to model the process you are controlling. And uh, this, by the way, is for any model-based control design method, even LQR. But also uh, the number of parameters now to calibrate uh, it can be quite uh, large, meaning you have to calibrate the weights, um, also the constraints, also the, co the constraints often come from naturally from specs. And in particular, you have to calibrate the model. So you, you have a degree of freedom, which is the model itself. So we will see how to address the item in the, in the remaining part of my, of my presentation. Let me start with embedded quadratic uh, optimization. Uh, QP solution methods exist, at least from the mid-50s. Um, as a result, many QP algorithms exist, are available in the literature, also in the, in the public domain, uh, and also in commercial uh, codes. Not all of them are suitable for embedded control, however, uh, there are certain requirements that you need to satisfy, and I'm listing here the main requirements. Uh, first requirement is speed. So you want the solution to be computed fast enough, at least within the sampling interval, and not only on average, uh, but also in the worst case. Then the QP algorithm should not require excessive memory and uh, throughput. So still often you are limited by the CPU power you have available and the memory you have um, allocated for the numerical solver and for the control algorithm in general. These solvers should be numerical robust. Uh, often these algorithms are still run in single precision arithmetic. And last but not least, uh, the code implementing the algorithm should not be too complicated. So it should be simple enough so it can be analyzed by software specialists. So it should not rely, for example, on complex uh, external libraries, it should actually be library free. Uh, there are many algorithms, as I was mentioning, one algorithm for industrial uh, production applications is Odis QP, which is a general purpose uh, QP solution method and is written to uh, satisfy exactly the requirements I was mentioning in the previous slide. All right, now let's come to the prediction models. We need a prediction model for designing the controller. Now there are several ways of getting a prediction model. Um, first of all, a physical model might be already available, or you can take a fully um, data-driven uh, path by collecting data, experimental data, and uh, using system identification or machine learning to get a black box model, so to understand the dynamic input-output relations uh, of the process. Or you can have something in between, uh, which is a gray box model, where some of the uh, model uh, is modeled with physics and some other parts that you don't know how to model or you don't want to model in detail can be captured by black box models. Now, should the model be perfect? Well, actually, no. We have to remind, I like to cite this uh, saying by the famous statistician George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we just need to find a model that, even if we know it's wrong, it's useful enough for MPC design. So how can we say that the model is good for MPC? Well, it has to capture the main dynamics of the process, otherwise the predictions are completely off and therefore the model is useless. And how can we compare different models? Which one do we want to pick? Well, usually you look how the model uh, performs when used for MPC. So how actually the MPC closed loop system uh, performance is when you use that model. Now regarding black box models, neural networks have been quite um, popular to capture black box nonlinear dynamics already since the 90s. Nowadays are even more popular. First type of model you can use are um, new neural uh, autoregressive uh, models where the relation between the output and the previous NA values of the outputs and previous NB values of the inputs are captured by a neural network. Um, or you can use neural state space models, which is even better for MPC design. If you only have inputs and outputs available, so you don't have states predetermined, 
Then you can use recurrent neural networks. So these are also uh, state-based models with hidden states, where structure is quite general. So uh, say you have a data set of a certain number of inputs and outputs. So you can try and fit a model where the state update and the output functions are neural networks that depend uh, respectively on some vector theta x and theta y of coefficients and solve the following problem. So find the vectors of coefficients theta x and theta y such that the predicted outputs, so the output that you predict in open loop by running the model, match the outputs that you have in the data set with some um, penalty on the initial state as well as some regularization. So the unknowns of this problem are the parameters of the network as well as the sequence of states. Now this problem can be um, solved by nonlinear programming. There are a few techniques uh, available. Uh, a technique that I have been recently investigating is uh, to solve the problem by using extended common filtering. Uh, what I've done recently is to extend these techniques to handle arbitrary uh, convex and smooth losses. You can also handle um, non-smooth convex penalties, for example, in the case of L1 penalties. So you penalize the one norm of the vector coefficients in order to get a sparse model. And another method that I've been looking at recently for computing offline, uh, so for fitting offline recurrent neural network models, is a combination of um, ADMM, the alternating direction method of multipliers with least squares. Let me show you an example um, comparing the use of uh, this method, ADMM with least squares, or Levenberg market, which I named nails or name for if you use Levenberg uh, market uh, with EKF and one of the, the most popular methods in, in um, using machine learning for recurrent neural network which is a stochastic gradient descent method. Here the data set uh, consists of 2000 samples uh, of a magnetorheological fluid damper system and about 1500 are used for testing the model. Now this is the result you get with a very simple recurrent neural network model with four states and a shallow neural network each for each the state update and the output function with four hidden neurons each. Now as you can see here as a function of training time, uh, this is a performance, the mean square error obtained uh, by the model. And the one you see here in, in red is, uh, is gradient descent. As you can see, this happens quite frequently. It's actually slower to converge, where slower means you really have to wait quite some time in order to, uh, to decrease the, the loss. So the best fit, perfect fit is 100%. And 94 point for the goal is quite, it's quite good uh, best fit rate. And so in this case, a nails performs the best on training. Actually, the version with um, Levenberg Mark gives slightly better result on test data, which is ultimately what you want to, to get. Now let's introduce L1 penalties. So let's say you have a penalty 0.2 on the one norm of the coefficients of the weights and bias term of the neural network of the state update function and the output function. Here I'm comparing again the same algorithms and three different stochastic gradient descent methods, Amsgrad, Adam, and Difgrad. Um, as you can see, they uh, all reach more or less the same best fit rate on uh, training data and uh, on test data. What is interesting here is the sparsity that you get. Um, with nails, nails, and extended kernel filtering, you get quite some sparsity, so about 65% sparsity. Here and for this, have about 50% say sparsity with the EKF uh, in a computation time overall in the order of 11 13 seconds. While with stochastic gradient descent methods, um, you get similar performance, but it takes longer time. And the model sparsity is not as good as if you use these other methods that exploit a sort of approximate second order information of the cost function. And here is another. Uh, example where here I'm using a group loss of penalty so to try to remove uh, states from
from the model. So grouping together the coefficients related to the same state. And as you can see here, as a function of the regularization parameter for the group lasso, of course, if you increase the penalty a lot, then the model quality starts becoming poor. Of course, the model order will diminish because more and more states will be uh, redundant. But you can choose here, for example, around this point here, you have still pretty good uh, quality of fit on training and the test data. And a model order, which is small, for example, here you have a model order of three states, you actually get the best um, fit result on test, uh, on test data. And so this would be actually the, the model order you want to choose for this particular uh, data set. So what you do now with the, with the model? Well, the idea now is to take the model we have identified, so for example, a recurrent neural network model, and use this directly as a prediction model for, for MPC. So the resulting MPC controller will be nonlinear. So the way to uh, solve the nonlinear MPC problem, one way of solving the nonlinear MPC problem is given the current state and uh, an initial guess for the input sequence, for example, it could be the previous, uh, the remaining part of the sequence that was computed at the previous time step. You can simulate, in this case, the recurrent neural network model over the prediction horizon, linearize the model, so get the Jacobians of the model with respect to the state and inputs, and build a quadratic programming problem based on this generalization that you can solve by quadratic programming. And this will give you uh, an optimal sequence of inputs. Now, if you apply directly the first sample, you will do linear uh, MPC. The idea here is that instead of applying directly, if you have enough computation time, you can now use the new optimal sequence to simulate again the system, with the, so from the same initial state but for with a different excitation, get the new linearization, solve the new optimization problem, and so on. And you can guarantee convergence of the scheme if you, if you do a line search. So instead of directly applying the new optimal sequence, you, you select a sequence in between the current one and the new one that you have optimized. So all these approach, so this entire approach of sequential quadratic programming and nonlinear MPC, this is implemented in the Odyssey Embedded MPC, uh, which implements all the ideas that they have uh, described and is coded in C, is actually MISRA C 2012 compliant, so it can be used for, it's actually used for production purposes, and is using the efficient MPC specific, specific version of the Audis QP solver for solving uh, the QPs that arise uh, from the constructions. All right, now let's talk about calibration aspects. So what is the best calibration of MPC you can, uh, you can make? Well, the calibration depends on uh, different parameters of the controller. So let's call X the vector collecting all the parameters that you can tune. These parameters usually are actually the weights that you need to, to tune, that you use in the performance index, the covariance matrices that you use in the common uh, filter, extend the common filter, the, even the thresholds you use in the solver, these are all parameters that you need to, to tune. So how, what is the best tuning? Well, if you're able to uh, define a performance index, so for example, this could be the sum over a certain experiment of, or simulation of the difference between the output and the reference you want to track, then you can look at the problem of minimizing this function as a global optimization problem. So minimize this function with respect to x. So a very abstract way, if the function f captures what you want to achieve, you can use global optimization algorithms whose um, uh, goal is try to get the minimum with the least number of function evaluations so that um, you can minimize the number of uh, simulations or even experiments that you need to, to make. This is a totally automatic tuning of the controller and uh, actually we have used this also in, in many problems, it's quite, it's quite useful. So the approach has several um, advantages, however there are some limitations in this approach. Uh, first of all you need to quantify an objective function. 
Also, there is no room for qualitative assessment, so everything needs to be quantified. And sometimes, um, that's the reason why the function may be difficult to quantify, is that you have multiple objectives. So multiple objectives you want to minimize, and it's not clear how you want to blend those objectives into a single function f of x. So for this reason, we have developed an approach based on active preference learning. So we assume that there is no function f of x. The only information that you have is whether a certain combination of calibration parameters is better or worse than another combination. So what is actually asked to the calibrators is to say whether calibration x1 is better than calibration x2 or x2 is better than x1 or they are uh, equivalent. And so the idea is to learn a surrogate of the latent objective. And we have tested this approach for uh, semi-automatic calibration of MPC. The algorithm that we call uh, GLISP for uh, global uh, optimization using uh, inverse distance weighting and uh, rather basis functions. P is for preference based. Actually, this algorithm is part of the package that uh, is freely available. Uh, you can use it in Python with pp install, please. It implements both the global optimizer and the preference based uh, global optimizer. So the algorithm proposes a new experiment or simulation to run to the calibrator, which will execute it and will tell whether the new combination is better or worse or the same as than the current best found so far. And this piece of information, the preference, um, is based to update the surrogate and by uh, minimizing the combination of the surrogate function and an exploration function, the algorithm will propose another combination to test and so on. And here is an example. Um, this is an MPC for lane keeping, two inputs, velocity and steering angle and uh, three outputs. So now what you want to achieve, which are your objectives? Uh, here you have multiple objectives. You want to have optimal obstacle avoidance. So you want to avoid hitting obstacles and you want to do, avoid obstacles in an optimal way. You want the drive to be pleasant for the passengers and you want a controller that is not uh, too much expensive from the computational viewpoint. So these, are, these three objectives in particular are not easy to quantify in a single uh, function. And what we need to calibrate here are five uh, parameters, which are sampling time, the controller, the prediction and control horizons, as well as the weights on the input increments. So here's a snapshot of the algorithm running. So the algorithm will propose two um, combinations of sampling time and horizons and in this case we optimize the logarithm of the weights and then you decide which one you like the, the, the most. So in this case say we prefer the one on the right, click right. And these run multiple, um, multiple times. At the end after 50 iterations, which means after asking 49 um, queries, the algorithm will converge to a design in this case, sample time of 85 milliseconds, prediction horizon 16, control horizon 5, and these two weights on the input increments. So let me finally mention another application of global optimization. So using the same GLIS algorithm I was mentioning before for globally optimizing performance. Uh, here we use the global optimizer for the opposite problem of finding the worst case, so the worst performance we can get. And this is particularly useful for detecting um, um, corner cases, so worst case situations that we may encounter. This is a work we did recently where we looked at, uh, in particular, at the problem where we have actually the same controller and PC controller uh, that I was describing in the previous slide, used now in simulation. You want to make sure that there are no um, bad situations. And if there are bad situations, you may want to find those bad situations and see if they really make sense or not. So how to formulate the problem? So let's say now x is, is not a, tuning, a vector tuning parameter, but is a vector 
of uh, quantities that define a certain scenario. So, for example, it could be the initial position of the ego vehicle and the initial position and velocity of the, of the other vehicles around you. So, if you define, um, if you can quantify what is bad in a function f of x, then you can minimize the function where the minimum of the function will give you the worst case you can encounter. Let me give you a concrete example. So for the, the controller I was mentioning before, we define a, an index which is a measure of uh, criticality. So you consider the relative uh, longitudinal and lateral distance between the ego vehicle and uh, the obstacles plus other constraints and you optimize within certain ranges of the simulation uh, parameters so to identify critical scenarios. And in this case, for this particular setup, uh, the software actually identifies uh, 64 cases of collisions, so you will not want to want to implement that controller. Here are some uh, results obtained, say after 51 iteration you get uh, this combination of parameters determine the simulation scenario which leads to a collision. Or you can, in another scenario, you can also allow the other vehicle to change uh, lane. So in this case, the software will identify a scenario where you start passing and then meanwhile, you are, is, after you start passing, the other vehicle will also change lane and you will not be able to avoid um, a collision. All right, this leads to the conclusions of my uh, presentation. So just to recap, I've been um, proposing MPC as a successful um, technique for the automotive, um, for automotive control problems. Um, why successful? First of all, it has a long tradition of success in the process industry. So it's a really well um, established and well test um, method in, in those uh, process control problems. And at this time, um, it is also completely um, amenable for uh, implementation also in the vehicle, uh, in vehicle control problems in the automotive industry, also for, not just for prototypes, but for, for mass productions, as I have been showing in some, some examples. And why is this? Because modern ECUs can solve the MPC problem in real time, so there is enough CPU power and memory available on board to implement and solve the uh, MPC controller. And there is also software, industry-grade software, uh, available for designing the controller uh, offline, calibrate the controller as well as deploying the controller uh, in the embedded platform. And let me stress the importance of uh, controls in software-defined vehicles, where for the same hardware, if you change the software, you get completely different uh, performances and vehicle types of operations, then controls, which is the main component of the software that determines the way the vehicle behaves, it's, it's really important. And uh, that's why I conclude my presentation by saying that control innovation is really essential for having a high performance vehicle and ultimately to have success in the automotive market.